everybody. Uh, I'm Wes Solom. I'm a genetic counselor from HD Genetics, which is a company that's dedicated to providing remote genetic counseling and genetic testing options for the Huntington's disease community. Uh, but today I'm here on behalf of HDYO or HDYO for a series called HDU to share stories from the HD community. These stories are told by and for the HD community. Deciding to test for Huntington's disease is one of the biggest decisions that someone um, with uh, at risk for HD can face. And today we're going to hear from a couple of folks who have tested negative, RJ and Emma. So could we get a little bit of background information from you guys, where you're coming from? Uh, just, a, just a little bit of history from RJ, Emma. We'll go ahead and start uh, with Emma. Okie dokie. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so we discovered HD in the family back in 2014 when my granddad was um, originally misdiagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, and then he tested positive um, for Huntington's disease. Um, and then unfortunately, around the same time, my dad also tested positive. Um, I didn't really know anything about it. And I was away at university to so sort of buried my head in the sand a little bit, to be honest. Um, and then it was only when my granddad passed away um, that really I started looking into it. Um, and then, yeah, decided to go down the testing process in 2015 myself. All right, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, RJ. Um, yeah, so my name is RJ. Um, I live in the US and um, as for me, my grandmother, my father's mother, um, passed away of Huntington's disease. He came from a large family and multiple people had it. Um, I remember he was kind of right at that age where symptoms would start to really come in. He wasn't quite sure if he had symptoms and uh, gene testing was available. So um, he went and got that and tested positive for it and i have four siblings one of the siblings got tested at 18 and i kind of saw a little bit of the darker side because she tested positive at a young age so i wasn't quite sure if i was going to get tested my family was telling me like not to get tested um my mother and my father split when i was very, very, very young, like don't even really remember. And um, he kind of just said like, it's best if they don't have to see this, right? And I'm sure there was other stuff involved, but I think that had a big play to it. And so um, they're both from the UK. He moved back to the UK and, you know, he'd come visit, I'd go see him. I would kind of see the disease progress. He came and lived here for a while um, for some years. So, um, I kind of always knew I was at risk. Um, I waited a little bit, you know, later, um, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, mid to late thirties. And, um, I just wasn't sure if I was going to get tested for it or not, or I was going to wait and see, but like the stress of not knowing if I have this disease and then kind of as I got, as I'm getting older, like things don't work the same. So you wonder, right? And you start to symptom search and it just became like very consuming for me as a person. So I really felt compelled to like, I need to test. So that's kind of, you know, my side of things. Gotcha. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a little bit of um, uh, symptom searching, uh, kind of feeling like maybe something was coming on and that that, that was maybe the uh, your way of kind of seeking an answer to that question as to whether or not that was Huntington's disease or or something other than that. How how would you say that Huntington's disease has affected you? I know that that's kind of a broad question, but and um, either are you speaking sorry. to me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, RJ. Okay. Um. How I feel Huntington's disease has affected me is it's affected like every life decision that I've made or every life decision that I didn't make. It's affected me psychologically. It's affected me mentally. 
um, yeah, it's affected me in the ways that I need to see the people around me, you know, suffering from that. It impacted me in the way that that, you know, that could be me. Um, and just like growing up and every life decision that you make, like it just changes every part of your psyche. Right. And it's not, it can't just be one thing. It's just, it's a worldview. Right. And then my worldview was that I have this disease. Right. And then I'm positive for it. So it's growing up in that mind frame, right? Because there's different ways that you can grow up and different ways you can think about it. And I had myself 100% convinced from a young age, from my early 20s, that I for sure have this. I, and, and so I've lived my life that way, right? And, you know, it's, it's kind of like I am where I am in life because of that kind of over my head a little bit, you know? So I guess that's like how it's impacted my life is it's not just one thing. And then if you really want to drill down to like how it's affected somebody's, you know, life and their mind frame and those types of things, it's like, what do they think? Do they think that they have it? Do they think that they don't? And it goes even deeper, right? So it's like, no, two people's experience and impact will be the same there's an infinite amount of possibilities you know so absolutely and emma how has huntington's disease affected you in your life um i think it in it's impacted my life in quite a similar way actually to rj but i suppose the the main difference would be um i feel like i've put my life on hold almost um because I I've been sort of a sole carer for my dad um since 2015 um so that sort of took over my life um in terms of you know socially um I would all I would want to do and still do now really is spend time with my dad because I almost don't want to miss out on any opportunities and any ways of making memories so you know uh, an option to go off and do something but potentially miss something with my dad I'd always pick dad um mm. so I, I guess it's impacted my life in that respect um I think it's also emotionally and mentally um it's had a huge impact as well um knowing that my dad is going through it um my brother unfortunately tested positive as well so he's going through it and then there's potential future generations who may be impacted it's sort of a like rj said i feel like it's almost like a gray cloud that follows you around all the time and it just sort of feels like there's no end to huntington's disease so i i try and spin it around in a in a positive way and try and talk about it as much as I can and and share our stories as much as we can just to educate people and yeah make people feel a bit more together sure and Emma you know RJ had just described that feeling of sort of being convinced in your in your 20s RJ that you you did have HD that this this was just gonna be the way that it was and you hadn't tested yet but you sort of had this like um feeling that if you were to test, you would test positive. And I'm wondering, Emma, did you have sort of a similar experience? Were you feeling one way or the other, or did it kind of fluctuate? It, it fluctuated, but I would say I, I probably had, I almost feel bad for saying it, but I almost had a feeling that I didn't have it. Um, mm. And it was almost more testing for the confirmation of not having it. And I, I, people say to me you know how can you have a feeling that you haven't got it when it at the end of the day you've got a 50 percent chance but mm -hmm. I don't know I think it's because I'm you, you look at me and my dad and we're we're so different and I don't know it was for, for me deciding to be tested was more of a, a scientific decision I guess and I sort of turned my emotions off to it um because I wanted to go down the how do I go about having a family um, mm -hmm. and knowing what I needed to do in that respect um, before I found out about 
PGD IVF and and those sorts of options. Um, but I, I guess fundamentally, I did sort of have a feeling that I that I didn't have it. Hmm. Okay. And RJ, how did that how did that land with you? Like, how did that feel finding out that your test result was negative? You know, having this feeling that it was going to go another way, that it was going to come back positive, meaning you did have HD, to get a result that said, no, actually, this test result is re 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 revealing that it's not Huntington's disease. You're not at risk for HD. How did that feel? So I have two answers to that. The first one is, is I'll let you know. And it's a, it's sunk in. <laughs> it's sure. been it's been less than a year um, since I've gotten my results. Um, it's been about eight months or so, um, and it's just still processing all of that. So, but you know, to answer your question, how did it feel? It was very shocking. Um, all of the things that I thought weren't real for my whole life. Um, like, I don't know. I think I had mentioned to Jenna, I used to make a wish, um, every birthday candle, every, every, everything, right. Every shooting star, anytime you wish on, you know, when the clock says 11, 11, you name it, I wished it. I was the wishing guy. And I don't know. I always wish my whole life that I didn't have this and, you know, like, any other way but that right like because i did see my father suffer like i did see his siblings pass away you know i heard the stories um and i just try to distance myself from it and so like to hear that totally just shook my world like now i gotta find something new to wish on right it's like those little things that you don't think about Mm -hmm. that are there you know um and it just goes down to like everything and then you look back on your life and you're like what if I would have done this you know what if I would have got tested earlier or what if I didn't get tested earlier what if I got tested earlier and I was positive was it better that I waited and it's like all of these emotions like I'm mad at myself I'm happy with myself like I don't really quite understand like how I feel and people told me it's going to take you six months to really let it sink in. And like, it's going to take a minute. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to get these results. They're going to be the best results of my life. I'm going to, you know, exercise extra every day to take care of myself and, you know, eat a bunch of healthy food and take care of my life and be happy. And it's a second chance. And now that I've gotten those results, it's like that happy dream that I painted in my head of you know life is going to be this way things are going to be this way you know you're going to feel this way like if you were to have a negative result like none of those things are real you know i'm still the same person i was you know wherever you go there you are and i don't know so when did answer but that's how i felt getting those negative results and those are some of the thoughts that i think about yeah, no, that's a great answer. I mean, I, I think that that's that's not uncommon that that folks maybe have an idea of how they how results will hit them, how how it will land with them, and how life might be changed uh, as a result of those learning those results. And sometimes that that does match up, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, Emma, I'm wondering for you, was it was it sort of similar? I know you described it as sort of a scientific approach to getting the the test done and trying to just essentially gather information but how did those results yeah. land with you the uh, it was definitely a, a sense of relief um but then i guess with with hd it's okay yeah i'm i'm gene negative but everyone else in my family or you know on, on that paternal side are, are still at risk and i was i was the first one of um, my family members to decide to get tested so I don't know I almost felt there wasn't really I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it who really understood um it was almost just I'm gene negative and everyone was like yay that's amazing um which I'm obviously very grateful for but 
I don't know it's just it's so much bigger than that isn't it um yeah. it doesn't go away I guess and you know with you know with with the journey things caring for people it's own it's a progressive disease so you're you're always watching things that are unfortunately going to get worse so even for my particular instance it was it was a relief but it doesn't get rid of rid of it yeah absolutely i i've heard it described as you know folks saying that when you test you're kind of putting this all all uh to that day of saying you know it's going to come back positive or it's going to come back negative or it's going to come back in a gray area but that's a whole different subject but either way i'm going to have some sort of um path forward from there and that the that the result comes back negative can kind of shift things in the sense that there is this personal relief but this kind of complicated reaction of of um hd not being gone from your life right that you've lived a life that's been affected by hd in various ways sort of a, as rj as you were describing it a bit ago about feeling like um every thought and every sort of uh decision that was made and every wish that you made was sort of colored by hd and then suddenly that's different but you do still have those memories and you do still have family affected by hd so gone maybe is the personal risk of hd but still with you is is sort of all these other aspects of hd in your life and i think that that can be kind of complicated to to um conceptualize when you're going through the process of you know considering testing for hd which kind of makes me you know uh wonder about your personal journeys of of deciding to test for huntington's disease and i'm kind of wondering like when did you first start thinking like really thinking about going through genetic testing and what did that look like for you what was ultimately the push to say okay you know what now is the time uh emma i'll, I'll start with you um so growing up uh my mum and my dad separated similar to rj when i was very very young to the point where i don't remember them ever being together um and my dad lived about 200 miles away. Um, and then when he got diagnosed, we decided um, that he should move closer to myself and my brother because the services are much better, sort of, you know, long for long-term care um, and those sorts of things. So he moved up about six months after he tested positive. And I think what made me start to think about it was the fact that I was then in full caring mode um I was doing all these things for him I was helping him I was spending most of my days with him and it was just so in my face all the time I guess um and then that's when I really started thinking oh my goodness this this could be me um what does that mean for for my future um and then I guess I'm just one of those people that if if I can find something out about myself um I, I I want to know about it um even if it's a a positive situation or a negative situation I think that's something just knowing about it is something that I can have control of um and that's that's what pushed me and then literally a few weeks after deciding I was seeing my GP asking to be referred yeah okay it was a very quick snap decision okay yeah and you know if you if you don't mind um i'm kind of curious about your process what your process looked like so going through genetic counseling that whole experience for you and and i want to kind of uh hear about your experience and then ask rj uh his experience what led to your decision of testing that kind of mo motion forward and then that path forward what that looked like for you so emma what what did that look like for you? You decided to go testing or decide yep. to go test. And then from that point forward, how did that play out? Um, so it was the September that I had my GP appointment and um, I went in to see the doctor and I said, this disease is in my family. Um, I want to be tested. And he openly admitted that he'd never heard of it um, and wanted to go away and do a little bit of research. Um, but he and then I, th I think it was a couple of days later he phoned me um just to talk me through the process and asked if I wanted this referral to go 
And I said, yeah. Um, it was then in the December, I started genetic counselling. Um, but my my experience seems to be very different from a lot of people in the UK that I've talked to about it. Um, I actually only had two uh, genetic counselling appointments. Um, and they were with different people in different parts of the county as well um so I almost don't feel like I feel like I didn't really have the big picture um if I'm honest um before sure. I decided to go through the through the testing process um and again I suppose I was also very much like nope I want to know um nothing really was going to change my mind about it um so I went and had my neurological testing and um, blood tests in the April the following year um, and had my results within the May. So it was seven months, the process. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I, and then after having my results, I didn't have any follow-up appointments. Okay. And so RJ, I'm kind of wondering for you, you know what was the what was the ultimate catalyst that led to you saying you know what now is the time i'm going to do this i want to get tested and then what did that immediate uh you know path forward look like for you how did that unfold well i went to get tested um and probably about i don't know five years ago six years ago and when I went to get tested, the reason why I wanted to get tested was because um, I just wasn't feeling like myself, right? And looking back on it, I had other life stressors that were impacting my life that I didn't realize the stress of, the physical and emotional stress that it was causing on my life. I didn't correlate the two. So I had unanswered reasons of what was going on in my life why am i feeling the way that i'm feeling i don't feel normal and so i went to a doctor i didn't want to get tested for it but i wanted to go so i, I did a whole battery of exams for myself i spent um money at the kind of a private hospital i don't want to get into details but they did a lot of stuff just to make sure i was okay spec scan imaging in my brain and all those types of things. And I just told them I wanted, you know, a really in-depth checkup of my body and I'm willing to pay for it. Um, they said everything looks really good. And so I still wasn't convinced after getting those results. So I reached out to um, a, a very popular um, resource that's out there for people to use um, to get some guidance on this. And the guidance that I re I received was to a doctor. And I told that doctor that I would like to have an anonymous test. I don't want this going on my medical record because here in the US, if it's on your medical record, forget it, right? There's a lot of implications to that. Um, so I said I want it to be anonymous and it was just a very difficult process that I was referred to by maybe an organization that, that I thought would, you know, be there a little bit stronger than they were. Um, and I explained to him kind of how I was feeling and I wanted to get this test and et cetera. And it seemed like I was more a science experiment to, we want your medical records. We want to look at your spec scan imaging. If you do pet test positive, we would like to be able to link. And I get that, but this is my personal stuff and my personal life. And I just kind of felt like a guinea pig. And so I stopped the testing process and I waited years and years and years. And um, what kind of sparked that process was is I was starting to get older and my sisters all met. I got three sisters. They all met their husbands in college. We're still married to them. They have beautiful families. Um, I had my college sweetheart we dated for some time and I just realized it wasn't, you know, for me. So I was kind of later in life where, you know, late twenties where, you know, it becomes a topic of conversation, family, kids, those types of things. And I always felt like I wasn't whole to bring to somebody else. I was always like in the back of my mind that like, nobody will love me. Like nobody will support me. Like 
people got very emotional. Um, it, you know, those, those types of things that like, go through your mind. And so I was just like, uh, you know, me growing up and believing I have Huntington's disease, I'm like, how could like, I not love somebody who had like something like that with them. Like I would, oh geez. Like I would never do that. Like there must be people like me, but again, I was coming from my worldview. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to go like find that person like for myself and God, we might, we, we might need a do over here or something, but um, yeah. So I ended up like meeting somebody, like it wasn't my goal to meet anybody. Like I was still in my late twenties and it's like, it's there, but it's not really there. You know, things, things hit as you get a little bit older and we met and I was like, hey, I have this thing called Huntington's disease. And I think she was 26. And I don't think she really understood the, the capacity of what it was. And so, you know, we ended up having a kid together, being in a relationship together. And then I had all of these problems. And then her questions came out of the woodworks. And then we like split up. And I'm like, hey, if you're not going to love me for me and this is kind of the feeling I'm getting from you. Like, I would rather just be like alone. So mm -hmm. like I left that relationship and like she was there with me while I got my testing results, you know? So happy story years later. I mean, we're still really great friends. Um, but it was like during this time to where I wasn't feeling well, like I was realized I was getting older in life. Like I wanted to be whole to bring like myself to somebody else to say like, Hey, here's what I can bring to the table. And so there was like a multitude of factors. It was like a many year process from me being single to wanting to get the test to me being in a relationship to me having a kid to me not feeling well. So there was driving factors that were, you know, over some time that caused me, it wasn't just, Hey, I want to go get tested. I think it's time. There was multiple life events, um, surrounded by, do I, am I healthy? And there's multiple life events of what can I bring to the table in a relationship? Right. So mm -hmm. there was a lot involved with that. Um, so after I decided to go and get tested the first time I received, you know, resources that weren't necessarily, um, you know, as I told you, it felt more like they wanted my medical records and for me to be like a Guinea pig than just to give me mm -hmm. my test results. So I did some research and I finally, um, at the end of last year, so about eight months ago, I decided, okay, I'm for sure going to get tested, right? Like I need all my answers, question, like all my questions answered. I'm ready to do this again, right? But mm -hmm. I'm really going to do it this time. So I reached out to that same organization that I reached out to initially to get assistance. And I'm like, Maybe they have a new person and they can help me get some better help. Never a phone call back. Oh. So I had to go at it alone. And my family was telling me, don't get tested. Like, I didn't want to tell a lot of people about it. So it just I had to do it alone and like suck it up. So I went online. I'm very, very grateful that I found the University of California system so all of California, all of their universities, UCLA, UCSD, UC Irvine, UCSF, um, et cetera. I don't know if all of them, but a majority of them that I looked into, they all have anonymous testing sites. So I reached out to the campuses and to their department that does the anonymous testing. Um, I reached out to two campuses. I got called back right away. I got all the information that I needed. It was like a dream come true. Things were super smooth. Um, I decided to go to UCSF, University of San Francisco. Um, Dr. Duffy, whoop, whoop. Um, she's really great. But I, I met with her and their genetic counselor. They're, they, you know, want to make sure that I'm stable in my life because and one thing I will say is people tell you, do it when you can take the results, do it when you're stable, like do it when there's a, the least amount of life drama going on. So, because this is big news. Well, 
I tested negative and I didn't realize how big a news it would be even just for that. So I can imagine testing negative, but I said, I'm ready to do it. So I flew out there, um, met with them in person, um, got all of the information. You know, I talked on the phone before I went out there, had, you know, a brief conversation just to find out about my mental stability and everything. Luckily, I have a pretty kind of vanilla life. So it it was pretty easy for them to be like, all right, like we think he could take this news. And so they flew me out. Um, I went out in the morning. Um, I did an interview in person with a genetic counselor. Um, we went over like my family history. We went over, um, you know, just my history, my life, just kind of who I am and what I'm about. Asked like a lot of detailed questions. Um, and I just answered them honestly. And um, then I met with the doctor, um, a neurologist. They did some neurological like exams and things like that to see if there's any evidence of Huntington's disease on the spot. And then after that, they both kind of conferred and they allowed me to go get my blood test downstairs. So I went and I got my blood test and I flew home. And then it was said to be like an eight week wait, which was pretty good. And I think they got it done in like six weeks and I ended up getting them a little bit earlier, but um, yeah. And then they were there for me. Like if I needed any questions, if I didn't want to get the results, if they wanted me to stop the testing process, you know, before the blood gets tested, I mean, I was in control of everything from beginning to end. And I felt like very empowered. Um, I felt treated respectfully and it was just an awesome experience. And it was during that time, um, that I also met HDO, which has been a great resource in my life as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, RJ. That's a lot. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, you know, just to kind of put it out there, would you like to take a break uh, before no, we move on? Like, I'm good. I'm great. Okay. I know that's a lot to share. So, yeah. Um, well, hearing that, you know, this, this sort of brings me to a point that Emma brought up, which is she felt like, um, or at least it sounded like you felt like um, you didn't get the big picture. Like there was something that was sort of lacking or, or something that wasn't exactly what you had expected in your process. And I'm wondering if you could share more about that, Emma, about how you were feeling, uh, what, what you were receiving and what you felt like you weren't receiving. Yeah, so um, I think when I started, I, I only sort of realise it now looking back, if that makes sense. So when I was going through the process, I don't know, I, 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 I guess I did, I didn't know anyone else who had been through it. So I didn't have any, well, except for my dad. Um, so I didn't have anyone to, to discuss, you know, what should I expect? What, what's this? What's that? Um, but I think looking back now, I, it would have been, I'm surprised that they, I didn't have anything in terms of follow-up, um, mm. I guess. And I think I, I felt that everyone assumed that testing negative okay great you know she can move on with her life now sort of situation um mm -hmm. so I definitely feel like more of a follow-up would have been was needed um essentially and knowing how to process all of the information um yeah I think that was that was mainly it and i very much felt um when I was going through the process I was sort of pushed from pillar to post um mm. I the only time I ever met with the same person was the day that I had my um neurological test and my blood test by the um geneticist and then the mm -hmm. day I got my results every other time was a completely different person who I hadn't met so I felt like I was going through the motions at each appointment and just repeating myself and never really getting into the the nitty gritty of it really gotcha okay yeah and I know you know we've sort of talked about this a little bit but I'm curious you know bringing up the the uh the sort of um I guess hope or, or expectation or, or um 
sort of desire to have someone follow up, have a more attentive follow up and kind of help with the processing. It sort of sounds like how did how did those feelings feel for you in that time and the months that followed you, you testing, you know, and finding that your your test results were negative. I know you described a, a little bit of relief, but did that that sort of just um, did you feel sort of like, man, I really could use uh, a little bit of guidance here or a little bit of someone holding my hand through through that yeah I definitely think so um because as I say I think people just expect you to then just particularly friends and family who didn't really understand the magnitude of it I guess um never then really asked about it or or asked how I was feeling and I'm I'm quite an emotion I'd admit I'm an emotionally closed off sort of person so I would never actively say to someone I really want to talk about it um but there was nothing then ever sort of given to me or I was never reached out to I guess um so in that respect I think it was isolating really um and just expected to just move on gotcha yeah and RJ I know that you've just from what it sounds like from what you've described the team that you worked with sounds like a really excellent team with UCSF um, but I'm curious your experience with with your feelings over time following getting your results and and how you felt about the the follow up that you received and if you you know would have liked more or less or if there are any things that you sort of felt were things you appreciated about your process versus things that you felt like were kind of eh, maybe an opportunity for improvement there. I mean, things I appreciate about the process is that it was easy um it was transparent and it was honest and and it's all I was looking for in a process and I you know luckily that's the process I was able to receive from you know making that first call to getting a call back right to getting my interview right away to communication on scheduling tickets so I could fly out there um like helping to understand my rights like helping to understand my privacy um and just empowering me as a person um people were kind right um I was dying to get my results and I begged them like can we move my appointment up sooner I know you're getting them sooner than in three months or whatever so they like moved my appointment up for me to get my results so just like very accommodating um and then yeah I mean they're they're the follow-up that like Emma and I have, it sounds like like we've created our own follow-up, right? Like we've mm-hmm. reached out to different organizations, like we're ambassadors for HDO. Um, we've we've created our spot in the community and our follow-up. And um, you know, maybe some people don't have the time or don't have the resources or don't feel empowered or are going through so much emotionally at the time that maybe they just don't have the ability to do that right so i know Mm -hmm. that you know different organizations you know do outreach to people and things like that and that can help pick up the pieces a little bit but um you know i guess there was no follow-up you know there was no like hey how you doing it's been six months what can we do for you and it just makes me wonder is there that many people getting tested for this that there's no you know, program in the background, but I will say that I do know that the door is always open, right? If I ever wanted to pick up the phone or send an email or say that I need something. So maybe it's not that they're choosing not to follow up with me. Maybe it's they're giving me my space and they've let me know that if I need anything that I can reach out and they're happy to give me resources. And luckily I just have found my own resources. So sure. I haven't, yeah. needed it, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And in fact, I mean, I'm kind of curious if you look back on that time that you, you were considering testing, that you're sort of crystallizing that idea of, of deciding I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to do my testing. What did your support system look like then versus what does it look like now? So what were the resources that you were really feeling you could lean on then and what do you feel like you leaned on maybe in the time of learning your results and that you lean on now kind of in the in the aftermath of testing 
and RJ, you can, if he wants. Yeah, that's a really great question because um, I'm just a very private person just in life and I'm the type of person, I have a small crowd of people that I know really well and that's just kind of how I roll. So, um, you know, I already don't have a big network of people to go to as it is. Um, and when I went to get tested, it was literally me and Google. Like Google was my friend, Google was my resource. YouTube videos like this, watching other people's stories was the only way for me to get information. So there was, there was nothing. Right. And, the you know, and I didn't know that I, again, I, through this research and through the internet, I found HDO, which, you know, was a total blessing for me. And then things kicked in. Then I had the resources from HGO. It was, who can we get you with to get you a counselor, right? You need to talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist. Who can we pair you up with who's gone through this testing process before that you could talk to? Um, like, what do you need from us? Just random text messages and phone calls, like, throughout the day to be like, we're thinking about you. And I'm like, you don't even know me but thank you, you know? So yeah. like, that's the experience I got. And, um, you know, and then other than that, those were all the resources that I had. And if I had questions, I would go ask the doctors if I wanted to, but you just kind of, when you want to get tested, you want to get tested and you just want to go and get tested and it's your business. And it's like, you know, your thing and you kind of don't want people prying also at the same time. So I was kind of glad that I didn't have too much attention to me. I just wanted it to kind of go under the radar. So those were my resources before. After I was just, we went to Glas uh, Glaslow and with HGO and I met two people there and like we're the best of friends. We do FaceTime chats. We do FaceTime talks. I'm part of the ambassadorship program. I have um, different people that I meet that I'm able to share my experiences with. Like I've met a community of people. Um, and again, I'm going to give all of this credit to HGO for, for really standing out in the community and helping people and bringing this because I've tried other organizations and this has just been so great. But now I have like a plethora of knowledge knowledge available for me right and again i have a sister who's positive she's in her mid 40s i have um two sisters that are a little bit older than me as well they all have kids you know they're all untested one of my sisters is tested but huntington's isn't going away for me and my family right like it's here to stay for some time and like if my sisters have it like i'll i'll need to be the one right? Like to help their kids and make sure they have all the resources. And if they have it themselves, like there's a convention in San Diego, my sisters live in Southern California. I'm like, Hey, let's go to this. They don't even know it exists. Yeah. So I'm like the one getting all of the information for them and making sure. So like my network is so huge now that I've decided to go through the testing process and then I've gone through it and I've actually become involved in the community. And it wasn't in until I was going through the testing process that I wanted to get involved in the community because otherwise I just wanted to ignore this. I wanted to try to pretend like it didn't exist in the one day a month that I was really depressed over it was that one day a month and I had 29 other good days and that's the world I wanted to live in. Um, and looking back on it, maybe that wasn't the best world to be living in. So for me personally. Sure. Thanks for sharing that, RJ. Emma, I'm wondering for you, did you see a change in your your support system from the time that you started considering testing versus immediately after and then and then the you know amount of time that followed? Yeah, definitely. So when I um was looking into getting tested, it was I didn't do any research or in terms of, you know, looking to talk to other people who were affected or or anything like that it was very much like I've made my decision and a bit like RJ like I want to get tested and I'm nothing's going to sort of change my mind now I've decided um but in terms of my support system at the time um I kept it very small 
Um, so I didn't tell my dad because I didn't want him to go through sort of the emotions of feeling guilty if I tested positive. Um, not that he should feel guilty, but you know, it's, um, yeah. I think it's he he would have done um so I had my mum there with me who was great and um, she came to my appointments with me um and I just the, so the week before I went to my first GP appointment um uh, doctor appointment um I met my now husband um oh. so it was very much like this is the situation this is what's going on um you can stay <laughs> um but yeah the, this is what I'm doing um and yeah eight years later we're still here um so yeah he's very much been a huge support to me um and my dad absolutely adores him so it's 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 a nice support system to be in um in terms of then after after the testing process again I just sort of went into a little hole with it really and didn't didn't talk about it um and it was only then when I um things went a bit more difficult with dad and caring and because I was his sole carer um that it was just I was I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere and no healthcare professionals were listening and you know I was like I don't know what to do so I think the way that I got my emotions out was to set up my Instagram page um hmm. of my pops and HD and it just sort of took off from there really and you then become it was like a small little network and then it's just grown and grown and grown and that's then when I heard about um HDYO and I was just if I can educate myself more and talk about it more um then I think I'm hoping it will help future generations um and it's sort of now got to the point where again people in my family who are who are untested or unfortunately my my brother is positive and he's got two young children who are now at risk and it's yeah. I'm, I'm having conversations now with them in terms not the children but in the parents in terms of do we need to start discussing it with them and, and then those sorts of things and I feel like being part of the HDYO ambassador program I've got people on the end of the phone or I've got these resources now where I can gather as much information as possible to help other people within the family um just, yeah which we, there was just I never reached out to it beforehand so yeah sure yeah well RJ Emma thank you guys so much for sharing with us your story I, on this sort of last question I, I kind of want to ask you guys if you have any closing thoughts or things that you would share with the community who is maybe considering getting tested Do you want to go, RJ? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say it's got to be the right time for you. Um, so try and take out everyone else's opinion about what you should do and when you should do things um, if you're thinking about going to get tested. Um, I think it is important to have personally for me it was important to have a small network of people where I could talk about things um with and a bit like the um process that RJ went through I think it's really important to feel comfortable um and if something doesn't feel right then to to stop and see if you can then try and find an alternative way of going about it and always reach out and we're, we're all of us ambassadors are, are happy to talk to talk to people about anything so Awesome. And then I would say um, is it's very easy for us as people to, well, there's a couple things that I would say. So one of them is that it's easy as us to people to put blame and other things in our life and to say, I'm not a movie star. I don't live in a mansion because I could have Huntington's disease or whatever, right? Yeah. We always are looking for a scapegoat to blame our life problems, to blame our situations on, to find maybe a reason to 
make meaning and understanding of the way things are. And getting this test result isn't going to change who you are. And it's so cliche that you're going to wake up tomorrow and be the same person, but you literally will. And, you know, there are times and situations that getting this test result will, you know, help you out. But I think for the majority of it, it's probably not going to help you out. And you're probably still going to be the same person you were. So just make sure that you're getting tested for the right reasons, for, you know, the right people, for the right time. Make sure, you know, when the genetic counselors tell you you need to be stable in your life, we want to make sure things are good. They're not just telling it to scare you away. The impact of even getting a negative result is can be have the potential to be life changing in ways that you did not imagine. For example, the thing that you wish every day, you no longer have to wish, you know, it, it's the little things. So I think that's very important to note for people is just don't put too much weight in your test. It's not going to change your life dramatically. You know, and I'm sure if I tested negative, maybe I would be seeing a different tune, but I'm thinking maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. Right. And coming from somebody who thought they had the disease their whole life. Um, and then I would say, um, like, get involved. Right. Reach out. You know, if someone's watching this and they are thinking about getting tested or they have family members and they're just you know, doing a search, I would just highly encourage them to start to get involved earlier, the better, right? And looking back on it, if that's one thing that I could change, it's it's that I wish I would have done more outreach earlier in my life and learned about these things sooner. So those are kind of the two things um, that I have. Well, that's that's fantastic. Thank you guys both for those responses. I think that they're they're wonderful, wonderful thoughts for the community. Uh, Emma, RJ, thank you guys so much for joining me and joining HDU on uh, this HDU presentation to to reach out to the community and share some stories by and for the HD community. Much appreciated.